In just over half an hour, there'll be a minute silence here at Anfield to commemorate a tragedy 20 years ago that took the lives of 96 football fans. Today's football focus is dedicated to the memory of those lost at Hillsborough on a day that gave no hint as to what would follow. The FA Cup semi-finals, Wembley or bust. These are the great matches to win and the worst possible ones to lose. Forest, like last year, have been allocated the cop end. Meanwhile, Liverpool's faithful followers are at the Leppings Lane end. It began so well. I mean, Jimmy Hill and I were there to record some links for that night's match of the day. So we did our bit at the beginning, recorded the links, and um, we went up in the stand and I said to Jimmy, do you not realise my old mate we're getting paid for this? We were looking forward to it so much. And he rubbed his hands with glee. He said, isn't it great? He used to rub his hands like that. There are fans on the pitch here in the six-yard area. The referee's going to have to stop the game. There's an overflow behind the goal. And then we saw fans being pulled up onto the higher tier of the stand. They were getting on people's shoulders and the guys above were pulling them up out of the way. So this wasn't hooliganism. This was, they were in danger, these people. And I can only assume that there was overcrowding and as they tried to come out from behind the barriers, people at the front were crushed. Why? Why didn't the FA give us the big ends? Why? They opened the gates and they just let us walk in. You were the eyes of the world. You are our eyes. We saw some guys and I went up to two guys, two grown men weeping on each other's shoulders. I said, guys, what, what, what's been going on in there? They said, Des, they're dying in there. I said, dying? He said, dying. I mean, he got angry with me because I didn't kind of accept the word. There's at least 50 people dead tonight. I didn't have too much time to dwell on it. We had to get back to London to mount the programme that night. Well, this was to have been a sports programme. You will understand that on a day of such momentous tragedy, it would be inappropriate to show football action. The following morning, I was going on holiday. I hadn't slept a wink, I hadn't slept all night, so I was sitting there like a, like a, a mess. And a guy came up to me, you know how fans talk to those of us who work in television, he said, cheer up, Des, it may never happen. And I said, you idiot, it just has happened. You know, it's just one of those things. Des Lynham was presenting Match of the Day on April the 15th, 1989. He's one of the many moving testimonies we'll be hearing throughout the programme today. Well, these are the scenes around Anfield as fans make their way to the ground for today's game against Blackburn Rovers. To be honest though, the game itself feels like it's somewhat overshadowed by the memories of 20 years ago. And as we said a little earlier, there'll be a minute silence just before kickoff at 12.45. We'll also be visiting the place where the tragedy happened. Then it was the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. Rather poignantly, today Sheffield Wednesday hosts Derby County in the league and the club's managers Brian Laws and Nigel Clough were both in the Forest team on the day of Hillsborough. And here at Anfield, I'm joined by Mark Lawrenson, who played for Liverpool, of course, for seven years and knows all about the impact of tragedies on the football club. We'll hear from Mark a little later, but first let's remember the day itself and how an FA Cup semi-final between two of the most attractive teams at the time turned into the biggest disaster in British sport. Now, the nature of events 20 years ago means that viewers may find the following report upsetting, but this is how the events of the day unfolded on the 15th of April, 1989. The story bears retelling all the time. I mean, just uh, the, the experience of the pens. It took me 15 years to tell that story without crying. I wanted grandkids. I wanted the girls to do well, have a good marriage. Um, and we can't have that. We were at the scene, we could find out if everybody was okay. But they're sent home wondering and worrying and every time the phone rang, they, you can imagine this, the kind of state that the, the families would have been in. You know, time has gone by, but, you know, the, the scars will never, ever be healed. It's, you know, and the fans will never, ever forget it. For so many of us, 
The details are burnt into our minds. But a generation has passed. Some football supporters, adults now, don't fully appreciate what happened that day. It was a beautiful day, absolutely gorgeous day. I'll always remember the fella selling sunglasses, uh, a pound a pair to keep out the glare, and that gives you an idea of the kind of day it was. Trevor and Jenny Hicks and their teenage daughters, Sarah and Vicky, were Liverpool's season ticket holders. We lived in North London. We travelled up at least every couple of weeks and a lot more beside. People thought we were barmy, but it was the one thing that we did as a family and we loved it. To keep the rival fans apart outside, Liverpool supporters were given the western end of the stadium. This Leppings Lane end was the smaller of the two, its terrace divided by fencing into pens. I have been back here, but only in the press seats a couple of times. Never been back to the Leppings Lane. When you came out of the turnstile, first thing you see is the tunnel, which hasn't changed at all. And that takes you to behind the goal, where I'd stood many times. And it was a really, really bad view. And a friend of mine had said, when you come through the turnstile, head left, because you can get up on the bank in the corner. And it wasn't signed. As I remember, I couldn't see a sign. I couldn't work out how to get left. If you were in a hurry, you just head for the tunnel. That's what you do. I went left. I went left. And it made all the difference for me. We split up just outside the turnstiles. Jenny went off to her seat and the girls and I went in. I think Vicky realised I was quite upset that I was going off to sit in the um, north stand on my own. And uh, she called my name and ran up to me and gave me an extra hug and a kiss. So they went off down the tunnel. I went to get a coffee. They always tried to dump me at about this point because obviously they had friends to see and they didn't want the old man hanging about. So this is where I came to. It's the corner terracing overlooking the pens three and four right behind the goal at the Leppings Lane. It was surprisingly empty. There weren't that many people in this section. And that's what was weird about it because FA Cup semi-final, you'd expect it to be absolutely rammed and here it wasn't. And that obviously meant that somewhere else it was. The pens behind the goal, fed by the central tunnel, were, by 2.30pm, already uncomfortably full. At the same time, outside the turnstiles, a bottleneck had built up of Liverpool fans delayed in traffic. At the same match the year before, a police filtering system had eased the crowd's approach. This measure was not in place in 1989. We actually got into the turnstile area about half past two, um, put up with the crushing and what have you that was there, which was, you know, we knew it was bad and that, but this was FA Cup semi-finals, eh, you know. Anyway, we ended up getting got into the ground at ten to three. I was sitting just below the police control box, literally the steps up to it were, you know, if you like, I could almost touch them. And um, so we were sitting there and we think it must get a bit busy in there, and, but there was tons of room where we were. From the police control box above the Leppings Lane Terrace, Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield and his team monitored the terrace and the turnstiles on closed-circuit television. An officer outside, witnessing an increasingly desperate situation, radioed a request to open exit gates to relieve the pressure on the turnstiles. At 2.52 p.m., Chief Superintendent Duckenfield gave the order. Exit gate C was opened, opposite the tunnel, leading to the already overcrowded central pens. The tunnel was not sealed off. The 2,000 supporters now entering the Leppings Lane end were not directed 
to the less crowded side pens. There was actually a slope in the tunnel and of course people behind us and you get the momentum and I was just thrown into the stadium basically. And when I got into the stadium I was facing backwards, I was facing the way that, that, that I'd come. I got, I got myself turned on and just as I was getting myself settled I, I, I realised that um, there, there was people gone down, there was a couple of people, a couple of layers of people in front of me. I can't even begin to think what it must have been like right behind the goal, just beyond expression of how bad that would have been. The vice slowly closes, doesn't it? You know, and, and, and that was just what it was like. I remember saying to this policeman that, uh, you know, can't you do something about it? There's a copper in the direct line with me and I'm screaming at him for help, as other people are, and this copper just blanked us. Well, I didn't really see the kickoff, to be quite honest with you, because my concern was what was going on on those terraces. I tried to concentrate on the stands opposite, uh, because I could see there was things going on, you know, around the pitch, the, the, the fence, and I didn't want to, you know, look at it for fear of, you know, of what was going on like. I was up that end, the Leppings Lane end, and there was a, a, what I thought was a crowd invasion. And there's two guys came on that I went and said, look, get off, because you're going to get Liverpool Football Club into trouble. And one of them just looked me straight in the eye and said, Al, oh, there's people dying in there. In the end, the, the, the sky just become white and become like a tube. And the next thing I see myself in the middle, I'm looking down at myself in the middle of a perfect circle of people and my head's lower than everybody else around me and I can still, you know, feel the, the, uh, the, the crush on me. I think what happened then is that I've hit the deck unconscious, and I think I've hit the deck in a space where there's air. And within what seemed like a few seconds, there were people on the pitch from behind the goal, and, you know, you didn't know really why. The police inspector is on the pitch, and they've come through the barriers, and I can only think that's overcrowding. It doesn't look to me to be any sort of misbehaviour. I saw what I now know was Victoria uh, being passed over and handled out through the gate onto the pitch. And in that minute or couple of minutes that it took me to get you know, across the pen and back again, um, lo and behold, they're almost side by side, Sarah and Victoria, on the pitch. So we picked Vicky up and we put her in the ambulance. You know, I went to the back ready to get off to get Sarah as we literally stood onto the pitch, the ambulance was full, and I left with this awful dilemma. Do I get back on the ambulance and go with Vicky and leave Sarah alone, or do I go and look after her on the basis that, you know, Vicky's in the ambulance? And, um, well, if there's a little point in your life, that's it, I think. It was just chaos. It was absolute chaos, and people were using advertising hoardings as stretchers, and someone said there's people died and I think if you stood and watched something like that then it stays with you. So I decided I would go with Victoria uh, as the guy in the ambulance couldn't look after everybody and that sometime later Sarah would end up you know being brought to hospital along with all the other casualties. Ambulances were sent to the stadium but more than 40 of them remained outside. It had been wrongly reported that the situation inside was crowd unrest, not crushing. The policeman's come up and asked Cluffy and I to go and make an announcement um, for the police and the microphone wasn't working. So we went to the, where they, they play the music and everything, the announcer went into his room. And as I say, the, the, was, the punters were superb. <laughs> You 
can't really take anything in. You know, you can't take in that there's been fatalities. I don't think it was really until we went upstairs and saw our wives that, you know, it really sunk in that, that people had died. Imagine you're sitting watching that on television. And your, your, your family's at the game. Well, I was still a baby myself, um, nine years of age. Wondering at the time whether we had uh, anyone there that we knew really close and personal. I'm sure everyone was wondering, did they know anyone who, who was at the game? Local hospitals were inundated with relatives and friends of the casualties. The stadium's gymnasium had been converted into a temporary mortuary. We were asked to look at these pictures. And there, I was so relieved because I couldn't see Sarah. Which is an awful thing to say because you've looked at all these poor people. But you're relieved because you can't see your daughter on there. And um, I, I, I said to the policeman, she's not there. So he just said, look again, love. Jenny and Trevor Hicks lost both their daughters at Hillsborough. It was British sports darkest day. And that's why today's minute silence will stir so many emotions for those old enough to remember Hillsborough. That report was narrated by the actress and lifelong Liverpool fan Sue Johnston. She joined us a little earlier. Well Sue, thank you for putting the words of Hillsborough. It was a privilege. Uh, onto that report there. How difficult was that for you to do? Uh, quite difficult. Had to uh, stop one or two places and say, just give me a minute, because uh, um, even though it's 20 years ago, it's still so raw. I think not just with me, with everyone here um, belonging to the club. Um, it's hard to believe it's 20 years ago. It's as in your mind, as fresh as it was yesterday, as if it was yesterday. So it was, but it was also such a privilege to do it. I was so glad to be asked. I know you gave a reading on the 15th anniversary. Yes, I did. Um, that was very hard. <laughs> yeah, have your feelings changed over the years? But as you just mentioned, or are they just as raw as they were on the day it happened? I think they're, they're just as raw. I feel very emotional today because it's exactly the same sort of day that it was. Exactly, it's so weird. Um, and I think when I did the reading, what shocked me was how raw for the relatives, even 15 years on, their grief was. That really uh, took me back. I don't know why it should, because we never get over losing people, but they've never really had justice, and, uh, and well, their feelings are... I just feel for them. I feel for them every day, every time I think of them, every time I hear You Never Walk Alone or um, Eternal Flame, which was a hit record at the time, and I remember Mersey outside and Mersey... To, uh, radio and City all played this music all day and gave up-to-date commentaries and it was it was eternal flame and I can't listen to it anymore without wanting to weep. <laughs> Mark, how important is it to the people of Liverpool that Hillsborough is never forgotten? Well, um, how important is life basically? So I think as uh, you know we saw with Sue's piece there, it's 20 years and yet it, it doesn't feel like 20 years, it still feels like yesterday and I, had, I mean you just can't possibly sort of try and work out how a relatives would possibly feel now. I mean, every day, every minute, anybody who's got children as well, I mean, it's unbelievable. And I think, you know, as, as Sue said about the, the justice side of it, and you know, there's, there's a big game on here today, and yet it, this, this, the atmosphere already here is very, very subdued. And normally it would be one of anticipation, there'd be a buzz, and I think, you know, I've seen everyone over the Hillsborough Memorial. And we can, um, you can just, you can feel it. You know, and I mean, you weren't there, obviously, and stuff, but you, you can sense oh, it. Yeah. You get a real yeah, well, sense of it. Watch on television it, unfold. It is amazing, and, it, and it's, a, it's a very, very emotional, uh, you know, sort of time for anybody who's, who's ever been involved with a football club, be in whatever capacity. See, the one thing that stands out above all is how the football club and the community got together in its grief on this. It was extraordinary, and I, I, I went to the cathedral on the Sunday night for the service, but you couldn't get in. It was absolutely crowded, and outside there were thousands of people, and and. Um, people were holding radios up so that we could hear this, the service and I remember an Everton supporter coming with his scarf who'd lost his mate who was a Liverpool supporter and passed his 
so I passed his scarf through to have it laid in the cathedral and they they did the chain of scarves which was extraordinary mm -hmm. of, of Liverpool and Everton scarves from Goodison to Anfield and the flowers that were laid I mean practically covering the pitch and um, the community were extraordinary just knitted together and which is why my rivalry now in my heart for Everton is only friendly because I'll never forget how they reacted um, that weekend. Okay, Sue, thanks for joining us. It's okay, thank you very much. Well, John Watson was commentating on the game that turned into the Hillsborough tragedy 20 years on and he'll be commentating on Liverpool once again. John, it's going to be a hugely emotional day at Anfield, isn't it? Well, it certainly is, Manish. I must say, when I listened to that um, account by Sue Johnson, it brought back the haunting memories of that dreadful day when I was, as you say, in the commentary box, unable from where I was sitting to really convey the true extent of the tragedy because as the afternoon wore on and we were continually uh, putting inserts into grandstand as it was then, there was no way of knowing just how enormous the list of fatalities was going to be. Um, Inside the ground today, uh, Manish, it's, all, it's remarkable that the weather is identical to what it was that day when we all went to the semi-final in sunshine and, of course, 96 people never came home. I've been talking to one of the bereaved families this week and it's on a day like this that you realise they've been grieving for 20 years and this anniversary clearly as poignant as any. And uh, I just feel deeply that there'll be a lot of contemplation in the crowd today. There is a football match on, but I think Mark Lawrenson's right. For many, many families who were touched by that disaster, it's a minor matter compared to their memories. And John, we're a quarter of an hour away from the minute's silence. Is the atmosphere within the ground any different to usual? Well, I think what's going to happen, Manish, is that when we've had the minute silence, the match will take place under normal circumstances. But I feel I ought to mention that next Wednesday here, the actual anniversary, there'll be a service on the cop at six minutes past three. There'll be a two minute silence to coincide with the time the game was stopped at Hillsborough and 96 candles will be lit as a mark of respect to those who died. Could I just try to finish, Manish? It's very difficult here to finish on a, on a positive note, but the one thing that the memory of those 96 people has endured for football is that what came out of Hillsborough was the Lord Justice Taylor report. And when I think of the primitive conditions in which Steve Wilson, who was talking earlier, and all the other fans watched that semi-final, and then I look around this marvellous all-seater stadium here at Anfield today, and all over the country, in fact, there is a legacy. Safety came out of Hillsborough, and for that, we have to be grateful. A permanent reminder of what happened on that terrible day 20 years ago. Yes, a very good point, John, and we'll hear more on that a little later. We'll have reaction on today's events here at Anfield on final score this afternoon from 2.30. Press red for Ray. Match of the day is at half past ten tonight on BBC One. Tomorrow on Radio 5 Live, there's a Hillsborough documentary presented by Kelly Cates, Kenny Dalglish's daughter. And as John mentioned there on Wednesday, there's full coverage of the Anfield Memorial Service throughout the day on BBC News and on 5 Live.